would say that one of the things, the initiatives that Kenny Laird has undertaken is to try to consolidate research and we thank our ministry contacts to provide some of the data that they collect to come forward and also the programs who are offering e-learning uh, programs also send in a survey data. So we're trying to consolidate and collect. So we do encourage you to, to complete that survey, bring the data. The more that we can uncover, the more we can share and the more we can really validate the kind of quality work that is being done. Because I know it's there because I get one around and see it, but not everybody does. You know it, but it's really hard to show it uh, in this. So K-12, stateofthenation.ca, and Michael Barber was in and out on uh, our Zoom uh, <laughs> virtual feed. Um, he's the principal author that works with that. Um, so I'm not going to talk a little bit at all about much here. It's just that for the most part, individual e-learning took the paradigm. And now as we rationalize it, it becomes more integrated into blending, we're going to hear how these programs have manifested themselves in different places. When we measure <coughs> ourselves against others, we have always come out very, very strong. The INACO Awards, the CEA Awards, but those programs that are using e-learning approaches are certainly there. And the question becomes one about how do we regularly support each other, but also learn from each other, which is essentially what we got to do this. How do we go from that promise about technology transforming everything and really creating the pedagogical approaches, which are the clear and the consistent pieces that are within that? So we're, we, we had a great conversation about transformation uh, last night, and we hope that we can get into some of that uh, again today for part of it. Uh, so I'll go back to that. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is to talk to Penny Wallace, who's going to talk about the LEARN program. And I'm not sure you did have five or not, but no, 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 I'll, I'll wait for five. If I'm doing two, I'm going to put the timer on myself so that I don't shut up after a while. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and instead of being relaxed, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, let me tell you a little bit about first of all who I am and uh, then learn very quickly. My timer's starting. Okay. Um, I'm the CEO of Learn, and Learn's a nonprofit education organization. We're located in Laval, just a little bit north of Montreal, and we've been around 13 years. We were created essentially to try to level the playing field between the, um, the, 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 the French community in, in Quebec and the English community. There was a new curriculum, uh, it came out in 1999. We we're really excited about it because it's uh, social, uh, socially constructivist in design, competency driven, formative assessment, digital uh, portfolio. It had it all in 1999. Um, and the problem was that uh, we had a curriculum that no one had resources for, especially on our day. We had plenty of resources that would be constantly developed for the, uh, uh, I call majority, but the, the English uh, minority really didn't have anything. So we were created to try to offset and level the playing field between the two communities. And at the same time, um, prior to that, we, were in, we integrated into our organization uh, an, an organization uh, that Maggie started up in 1999, where we were doing uh, e-learning. Uh, and uh, part of our role was essentially to provide services and uh, online classes to students um, everywhere. The model that was chosen at that time was really a real-time delivery model. Uh, in other words, we had the teacher right online, worked in, right into the schedule of the students, so like for example, at 9.45, they would, instead of going to one class, they would go to an online class that we would deliver. And from 9.45 to whatever it was, uh, uh, an hour later, 15 minutes later, uh, we would deliver, uh, deliver that class and continue to do that. This happened primarily in areas where we had uh, diminishing enrollment, where the school could not justify the hiring of a chemistry or physics or a math teacher, um, where the, the uh, failure rates in certain subject areas were high, so we had to, to do this. Now, the reason, and I'm going to try and go quickly through this, the reason we went to a real-time model is that we put ourselves in the, in the, in the place of a, a 14, 15, 16-year-old who essentially says, well, listen, I, I am used to working and, and learning in an environment where I get a chance to interact in real time with the, uh, my teachers. I have my students next to me, my, my, my buddies next to me, and uh, now going into an environment where I'm doing it in an asynchronous fashion where um, I'm have to do a lot of it on my own. It wasn't something that we were comfortable with. Uh, we also felt that uh, that student profile 
that 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 typically are uh, uh, aligned with an asynchronous approach really only covered about five percent of that student population. So we figured that the ideal way to do it was to really go in a, in a real time delivery. So we have our own program now that we're using. It's like Adobe Connect, but it's a little bit better. Um, uh, and we've been using it for for years and years and doing this. However, over the course of years, years, what we did is as our uh, curriculum uh, changed, uh, altered, we started to obviously start to teach uh, competencies online, assessing competencies online, delivering it in, in a way that we integrated a lot of these uh, uh, requirements so that it was truly socially constructed. Um, but we also decided that it had to be more than just that. So we started to blend it. When, but when we use the word blended, we meant that we were combining our real-time delivery with asynchronous resources so that uh, the student would now be able to, to work in an ongoing and, and continuous fashion okay, up to four minutes. So um, that we kept growing on all of that. Um, digital portfolios now became a part of, uh, of what we were doing. Digital portfolios simply because we were firmly uh, convinced that uh, critical reflection, metacognition is at the heart of, of the learning process. So we had to integrate all that into uh, what we're doing. We use our uh, LMS for that. Um, we use Sakai, you know, just, just another LMS. Uh, they're all the same. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're all the same. Uh, you can try and convince me otherwise, but uh, I don't think I'm going to use that. But anyway, um, we've now moved on to an, an, uh, a few different things. Uh, and Randy showed you pictures of, uh, of teachers winning at INACAL International Awards. Uh, uh, those were our teachers who five years ago won an award for flipping the class in an online environment. Um, this year we had our teachers uh, actually win awards because we we're, we're really believing in student agency as well. So we're now integrating and, and, and obliging our students to do a lot of the work themselves. So in other words, like we step back and we're, we're really working as mediators. Uh, we talked about students being at the center of all this. We, we believe also in Scaramucci's uh, notion that it's a self-oriented uh, learning environment. So we, we push that. We really get the students into it. We have a holistic approach to it as well. In other words, students don't become ours at 945. They're always ours, and we work with parents. So social media. We have a, a student-moderated uh, uh, Twitter chats um, and forums. We, we, we use social media. Uh, on an ongoing and regular basis. We've included uh, micro-learning into it because it's a place for micro-learning uh, in an online environment as well. I guess at the end of the day, what we're saying is that there's no one way of doing things. We're always adjusting and adapting. This year, we're going to be integrating a, a student tracking program from ERA, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. We're going to be using that as well. Um, so it's, for us, there's a whole notion of of doing it online. I don't even like e-learning. I don't like blended learning. I don't know what to call it anymore. You know, I, I don't, the term is maybe e-learning network, but somehow or other, it's, I find it constraining. So I just call it learning. And, and uh, uh, we try to find a whole variety of different ways to, to make it happen. Um, I also designed and helped implement a program in, in Thailand for a neuro-linguistic uh, uh, approach to learning English as a second language, and it's in a blended learning environment. And what we did there with our teachers is what we, uh, something that we uh, I took out of uh, our own organization, and that is we we um, uh, spend a lot of time and spend a lot of time with the teachers modeling uh, and modeling and modeling so that they come to own the, the process. Uh, uh, my doctoral work was uh, basically on on all of that, and that is modeling social constructivism uh, uh, strategies uh, so that teachers who are transitioning from a regular classroom to an online classroom would be able to to do it in an effective way. And for us, PL really is that. They have to own it. And they have to own it by, by living it and modeling it all the time. How much time do I have? OK. Ah, God. I'm good? OK, six minutes. Whew. Actually, what I really wanted to get to was the, the heart and the, the juice of a project that we're now involved in. Because as I said, maybe I get fancy and digital. We're now looking at um, what we call the next school project. In Quebec, uh, about seven, eight months ago, uh, uh, our minister, uh, decided that the change wasn't happening uh, fast enough in, in our schools. And, and he was tired of waiting on educators to change. Um, there was lots and lots of tinkering around the, uh, the, the edge, and playing here and playing there. But he, he wanted to see something substantial. So what he did is he, he hired three businessmen 
to try to do it. And of course, that everyone is not for what one, one of them is. Uh, what's the name of the chef there? Uh, maybe he's a, yeah, yeah, exactly. And people, what? But anyway, whether that's good or not is is kind of like irrelevant. On the that that was mostly for the French side. I'm on that advisory board, but. Uh, on the English side, we said, well, yeah, we're, we're going to take a completely different approach. We're going to do this in a systemic way. We're going to look at really integrating um, everyone from the parents right up to the politicians because we want to, and we'll call them this the next school project. That's who stole that name from the organization. We asked them and they said it was okay. Um, and at the heart of it is we're changing the whole paradigm, the whole way that we, the school is going to operate. And we're integrating into that blended learning, online resources, everything so that it becomes a part of the whole learning structure. We're throwing out schedules the way we understand. Um, there won't be like a, a, a nine o'clock class and a 10 o'clock class. And, and, and we're actually trying to convince our ministry that let's get rid of, of, of subjects the way we understand them. And let's go to what we talked about uh, and was mentioned earlier, cross-curricular <laughs> competencies. Let's develop those things. Let's look at the broad areas of learning uh, and really address them in a way that is meaningful. We know all about authentic learning. We know all of these things. The truth of the matter is that in our own schools in Quebec, we had a lot of teachers, despite the fact that we have a marvelous curriculum, um, they're still stand and deliver teachers. You know, we walk through the halls of a lot of our, our high schools, and despite what, what, what the, all the great innovations that we've talked about, the delivery still sucks. You know, it's really not, not really evolved the way. So we need to uh, create a whole new paradigm. Sorry for putting this in the book. Um, yeah, so we're looking at ch changing it all. So what we've done is I said, we've contacted parents. We said, hey, are you happy with what's going on in your school? And guess what? Parents said, not really. You know, and especially in the context of, well, what jobs are they going to be taking on 10 years from now? You've heard all of this before, so I'm not, not going to bore you with it. But at the heart of it, the parents said, well, you know what? We don't really feel that our schools are preparing them for the jobs that they're going to have or, or the future that, 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 that's an unknown future. In, in 10, 15 years. Um, and then the parents, again, created a little bit of groundswell there. It's funny how politicians listen when parents start to say, well, what are you going to do? So we've gotten our, some, uh, some of our uh, uh, MPs and uh, members of parliament, and, and actually for the uh, Sunday night, and, uh, um, they're, they're listening now. And in between, we, we spoke to the teachers' union. And the teachers' union said, yeah, if you're serious about this, we're on board. And we talked to our, our, our uh, directors general of the school board. And I said, well, if you can put a model together that's going to happen, we're interested. Um, now, this is, a, a, again, systemic change. We're not trying to change one school. I was with Alan November in uh, July. And he says, well, you know, I went to a school. And I said, yeah, okay, good. You know, I, I, we can change the school. It's no big deal. It's not a big deal to change the school. It's not, let me get this with us. It's not that big a deal. Um, and what we're saying is, no, we want to change the way we do things in our, our community because we don't think that uh, um, it's, uh, we're really answering those particular needs. To make it sustainable and to make it scalable, it has to be systemic change and you have to get all the players in, in, uh, on board. And if you're not getting them all on board, you know, like if you talk to the teachers, the teachers are going to do great work. This is where we, we had a wonderful conversation last night. We talked about players, you know, some schools that do amazing things, and man, those teachers need to applaud them, and the, and the principals who are doing it need to applaud them. But the, the issue, as we see it, is that when they, they leave, or they move around, all that great innovation, all that great work very often disappears. Sometimes we're lucky, and that, that fling may start to spread. So we kind of agreed last night that what we want to do is at least get smoldering fires here and there, and that that smoldering fire becomes a, a raging blaze. From my perspective, uh, and, and from the, it's not mine but alone, but for the, for the people who are working on this, um, we felt like we had to get our whole community on. And so we, we've gotten 18 months just to get people to hear us and to come on board and say, yeah, we like this idea. And we put together uh, what we call an exploratory guidance group where we have students, because we believe in student agency as well, so what would you like to have in our school? And, and where do you think it should go? And we have parents, and we've got politicians. We have everyone sitting around the table. Actually, our e, uh, it becomes EGG, which is like a exploratory guidance group. Our egg, they're not chicken with the egg. So we're, we're working from the beginning <laughs> here. Got to a little, a little bit of time as we go along. So we, but we, when we talk about blended learning and e-learning in this 
new paradigm. This is like, it's not really all that new, you know. I mean, we're just trying to put into play um, what educational research is telling us we should be doing, um, and and creating an environment where we're uh, motivating teachers who want to teach. You know, no teacher ever. I, I think Maggie you told me that the, from someone out of Australia who said, "You don't become a teacher to join a union." You know, we always become a teacher because the teachers make a difference. Well, we're hoping that we're going to create um, an environment and, and, and something that's scalable and sustainable uh, over the years uh, and where teachers can be excited and motivated and also, most importantly, answer the needs of students. So that's kind of what we're up to these days, uh, among, other, among other things. But that's, that's at the heart of, uh, of learning. And it's probably the views that my background. Thank you. Right. So it's not being satisfied with having created a wonderful flair. You have to go on. You have to do some a macro systemic kind of approach. Yeah. So you did the chair of the Canadian e Learning Network. So the country is next. That's it. Actually, uh, I'm also on the Educational Council for the World Future Society, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of conversation going on around that, and, and where where do universities, what's the future of universities, and and as they start to question all that and credentialing, it becomes a, a really interesting discussion uh, to have. But the, it's exciting to be in education these days. I'm sure you all feel the same way. It's really exciting. We're at, we're at, at a cup where things are happening. We have opportunities. And it really, I think, it's all up to us to, to dive in and take advantage. Thank you. Thank you. Any quick questions from Mike? It's great to be here. I'm, I'm Jeff Stewart. I'm, a, like I said, a principal of this weird and wonderful school in British Columbia, Canada, that uh, serves, I think, a blend of learning programs in over 15 communities across BC. I have students in 60 of 60 school districts. Um, and our next big task is taking on blended online learning. Um, which everybody goes, what? They can't, they can't do that, Lottie. Um, I spent my first 30 years in Ontario. Um, of course, it was good to be back. Um, uh, grew up as a boy in Kingston. I was in the Fort Henry Guard, went to Queens, went to the Ed in Queens. Uh, the more around here, oh, Simcoe County, yeah. And the pot was still around here, for years, back in the mid, late 80s. So it's kind of good to be back. I'm sort of closing in my second, third years in BC. So um, it's just great to be back in the The context for innovation in, in, in British Columbia is very interesting. Uh, like Ontario, we've gone through a massive revision and overhaul over the last seven, eight years. It began with the BC Education Plan. Uh, it was really led by a guy named Rod Allen. He's now the superintendent. How he got out of the ministry, kept his sanity. Um, but it's really uh, that it's a really a transformational approach. At the heart of it is really an inquiry, project-based learning. Go deep, not thin. Get rid of the outcomes, a thick list of outcomes. Get into competencies. Three big ones are, of course, thinking, communicating, and pushing social responsibility. So that's really the heart of the BC Ed Plan. So they came out um, when Rod was up in the ministry and. Uh, they said, change, innovate, go for it. And I was, um, I was a pig in mud. It really was uh, a wonderful time. And uh, it still continues, but we've had some shifts and some nuances as they start to uh, get deeper in that transformation. But that provincial agenda is really a transformation agenda, and it's still alive and um, going on. And then we also had a, a, a superintendent that really wanted to be progressive and do things differently, provide choice. The mechanism was choice. So choice programs across the district that would stir up the pot and give um, students and families alternatives. And so she came to me and said, Jeff, do some stuff. So I got to work. Um, and then we had a school that was a traditional, you know, DL school, paper-based, PDF them to death um, type approach. Uh, came there seven years ago, and it, you know, from there we've gone fully online and blended, and uh, it's really, uh, really trying to address some of the challenges in BC's DL policy, uh, which is probably the most regulated jurisdiction in in, BC, in Canada in terms of in North America. Like, yeah. uh, we have regulations on top of regulations, and I made it my personal agenda to try to break every convention they throw up. Um, because it really needs to in this 
it, it really contradicts a lot of the provincial agenda, district agenda uh, mandates. So that's what I've been up to. We went boldly blended in 2012. We created a whole bunch of different programs that uh, were three days a week, face-to-face, -face, two days online at home. So the kids were actually only face-to-face -face for three days. Uh, we created independent learning centers in all of our secondary schools. So they had a teacher on either side of the screen. So they had a computer lab that was converted and updated and I threw all sorts of money and upgrading the technology and make it a sexy place to learn. And it started to transform our secondary schools because all of a sudden the kids can go down the hall and take a course from the DL course they want, the online course they want. And that starts to transform what goes on in the building because kids can vote with their feet. Superintendent fully supported that. And so they took off. They're now in all of our secondary schools and they're full-time uh, ILC teachers that really support students and they're passionate teachers. They're full-time at this. The passion is supporting the students on the other side of the screen. So that's really, that started to do a little disruptive in um, dissonance going on there. Enter was the STEM program. Started as a six to eight program, then it grew up to eight, nine. Now it's all the way up to secondary and I make it. We call it. It's uh, again, that blended model of three days, face-to-face, uh, -face, two days online at home. And of course, the Fine Arts Academy, which is a K to eight right now, and I'm being passed to try to grow it all the way up to 12, uh, which is really throwing um, a curve at the way we uh, teach. And both en Enter and Fay really get deeper that way uh, because they're really focused on uh, some different things in education. So those initial three back in 2012 have quickly become this. Um, the school's growing. It's now the largest school in the district as a DL school. Um, and like I said, I've got clients from all over British Columbia. Um, they're, they're coming in droves. Uh, there's a lot, parents are hungry for change, uh, especially in the, the K to seven sector. They're really tired of the standard brick and mortar realities that the children face. And even the homeschoolers are coming to us just now because they want to uh, get the teacher support, not just be isolated on their own. Um, so we've now got a high performance athlete program. We've got running a high school in Roslyn, a small one. <laughs> Um, and, but it's a blended version. The kids are there 50% of the time. So they have a, a absolutely different um, platform. The Hartwood Learning Community is really uh, that homeschooler type clientele that supports students you know, if they have their own teachers uh, in situ in communities. Uh, they do one or two days face to face and rest days uh, in a blended model. And we're just starting a new program called the Compass Program, which is uh, a new two day program as well that parents are going to. That's just part of it, but that's, it's really growing the school. So what went right? That's one of the questions Dan, uh, Randy threw at us. What went right when you were doing this? Well, we got, a full, we got all philosophical and we put together a, with our staff, with our teachers, a philosophy of learning that they could all buy into and our parents could buy into. And it was really about, at the heart of it, a couple of things. Getting back to teaching kids about flow because we don't do that in public education. We erase their curriculum and we don't give them time to go in deep uh, and really find um, their own passion. So we talk a lot about flow, it gets in the high. Uh, think, you know, the whole idea of autonomy, mastery, uh, and moral purpose uh, in life, and trying to get those kids to be really deep citizens. Uh, we really believe in the whole concept Dr. Peter, the late Dr. Peter Benson, um, brought to us, which was the whole idea of sparks and speaking and driving programs through children's sparks, because when you get what they're passionate about at the heart of what they're doing, the literacy, numeracy, numeracy and all the other stuff just kind of falls into place because they want to be at school uh, and they want to learn. And that drives so much. If you transform one thing, that deal, start programming based on children's sparks, which is why we have a STEM Academy, which is why we have Fine Arts Academy. And of course, Ken Robinson's plea to value every child for who they are and what they bring to the table, their own passions and their own purpose. We got all entrepreneurial. I hired a marketing firm. We changed the name of the school, North Island Distance Education School. First of all, we're not only um, North Island anymore, we're provincial, uh, and we're not distance ed anymore. We're flexible in our environments. Um, and so we spent about 35 grand a year in marketing and advertisement and branding communications. Um, it's just part of the BC context, which is highly competitive, highly, highly competitive. 
we got all bendy and twisty. Um, we kind of ignored the curriculum police, not outright, but um, we wanted to do stuff differently. They have this policy in BC um, where a DL is 50% or less. And the funding system gives you less if you're DL and about $1,000 per FTE more when you're face to face in brick and mortar. But there's mandatory hours that brick and mortars have to spend in the buildings. So really the policy is up to 50 and nothing between 51 and 99%. So I purposely put in 62% and got full funding. Because they don't know what to do. Their own policies are contradictory. Um, and so that's kind of an example of how you can ban those policies. Not to be a rebel, it's just to try to provide really um, wonderful learning experiences for students. And there's a huge demand out there for it. It's a huge market. Um, and that's the way I kind of look at it. We got all we got all parent community friendly. Um, we really embrace parents as co-facilitators of learning uh, and actively involve them in, in the work that the students do. And that has is such a beautiful field to plow if you actually do it well. Uh, you get the rewards like you've never imagined. The, the parent participation in the Fine Arts Academy and entering those kind of things. Um, the parents say it's transformed their family life, not just their students' approach to learning. Um, so it has very powerful uh, social overtones as well. Um, but just getting our community mentors in there, getting our uh, parents in and working. We actually have a week where the students are out in the community four times a year learning from mentors in the community. We have an alternate uh, calendar. Uh, so learning cycles, a project-based calendar where the students go to school for nine weeks and then they take a week and they go out in the community and do work. Teachers are not faced with doing the face-to-face -face work, so they can meet with each of the parents and then work through the student learning plan and have that really rich conversational deep stuff about their child learning. And that's paid off hugely. And the communities in the school like never before. Um, they're just community mentors are in the school um, every week uh, working with their students, uh, doing some of the projects. What were some of the, those are the main uh, the things that went well. What were the things that went sideways? What happens often when you do these startups is managing expectations. You know, when you start something new, there's a lot of people have a lot of enthusiasm. They all inject their own agendas into it. And they all have their hopes and dreams. And we started the Fine Arts Academy and everything from parents who thought they were going to send their kids to the Royal Winnipeg Ballet to, to uh, parents of children with special needs that wanted a more welcoming, inclusive environment and everything in between. Um, it was really a, a, a huge conundrum. It was trying to make, you know, that first few years filter down the expectations so we were clearly communicating what these programs would do. Um, it's that old Kennedy thing about, you know, um, success has a hundred fathers and, uh, and failures of bastards. So when things crash, they really crash. And all of a sudden, all the folks in the district go, oh, I never knew anything about that. And then you're sitting there going, <laughs> shoo, 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 shoo. arrows are coming in from every direction, right? Um, so what, what went sideways is if you're a district officer, is stand by your people, be in, be present in their buildings when they're, they're launching these, um, these new programs and going deep, um, get involved in the problems, not just the, uh, the uh, kudos that come out when, you, when, you, when it's a success. You gotta share the failures um, because that's what it's all about. And sometimes it can be pretty lonely when you're out there doing stuff uh, way out, outside the norm. Because a lot of people don't like it because it's outside the norm. Um, managing growth, that's becoming uh, a big part of it. It's just really trying to control growth for a very limited amount of staff um, in, in a school that's growing um, exponentially. So, you know, there's all those things we talked about, um, about going sideways about resistance and retaliation, um, and just really trying to support people in, in the field while they're doing things. Deep thoughts. So here's my point about you know what are the takeaways for you to sort of bring some back, and this gets back to the conversation we had last night. Um, fire, ready, aim. Throw it out. You know, you know just, just start, start building it while you're doing it. You've all seen the photo of the plane or the building the plane in flames. It really is that. Uh, you get involved in it. You got to give it five years uh, for the these startup programs to really come to to fruition and mature fully. 
and you gotta share the pain through it. It's not gonna be successful in year one or two. Um, it takes time, it really does. Uh, and you have to really, um, I find when you build something, the right people come to the table. Sometimes they're not a great fit, but they find it um, because they wanna go there. It's, if, if you're doing something outside the box, it's the people that will embrace it outside the box that will come to you. Um, and it's just really getting uh, deep with supporting them, stepping back and watching that, their creativity. Think small. Scalability, I think it's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's the biggest red herring in education. Um, you know, I've, I've been around now in education for a lot of years and I've seen district initiatives, I've seen ministry initiatives galore. And um, I really have a problem with that term scalability. Uh, you might, you know, there's always a teacher factor. There's always that. Uh, and we have to stand by our teachers and really be there with them and support them through these programs. And I think that what I've seen is when you start small and have a big impact, it serves as an example, an ember, not a flare, uh, that really starts to catch on. And I've seen teachers go from rapidly anti-online learning to they could teach now without using Rosetta Stone uh, as part of their mainstream French course, doing online learning that way. So embers matter. Um, it's not flares. Think small, not big. Make a success of something small and it has a huge impact. Maybe not on all students, but it also serves an example. And those embers will spread. Uh, the top-down scalability thing, I've never seen it succeed. Passions and sparks, the center of learning, that's where we have to go. Um, we're gonna, you know, we all have the literacy and numeracy agenda in every jurisdiction in North, North America. And if we're beating that dragon to death, we'll turn the kids off. You gotta get back to what they love and inject the numeracy and literacy in it. And when you do that, the magic starts to happen. Um, my last piece is look for what's not there in your districts. Look for what's not there. Look for the, the periphery of demand because I'm telling you right now, parents and students are very hungry for very different approaches, non-traditional approaches to education. And they're coming to it in droves when you build it. Look to those alternate places out there that are really wanting to grow and find a home. And you will actually be very surprised when you actually step off the dock jump into the pool of change and putting these things out there, how quickly the students and parents will come. When we created the Fine Arts and Enter Academy, they filled up within about a week and they've had waiting lists for the last five years. Uh, the, the parents are crazy about they have three days face-to-face -face with their kids, two days at home, so they get a four-day weekend. This is a small example. But look for what's not fair in your districts, in your jurisdictions. Thanks for listening. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm from uh, a, a jurisdiction that surrounds Calgary on three sides with about 22,000 kids. So I'm uh, uh, the director of technology for learning. I've uh, been in the role for about 11 years now. And uh, Alberta, over the course of that period of time, has transformed a lot. It's had a number of key initiatives that have that have uh, supported all jurisdictions that have been really useful. One was something called Alfred Initiative for School Improvement, and uh, it was a project for all, that all jurisdictions got involved with, all students, teachers got involved with, and they created action research plans and investigated um, teaching practice. So that, there's been a number of initiatives like that or government grants that have been, uh, students could apply for, uh, if we were able to apply for, that could help trans Form uh, jurisdictions and, and create change. And uh, since uh, I joined Rocky View as their director of technology for learning, uh, we've, we've been involved in a number of them. Uh, one of them uh, has to do with uh, uh, implementing technologies into the classroom. And we had to figure out how we were going to tackle that and, and really make it valuable and valuable for, for our uh, students. So, one of the things that we uh, have really worked on in, in all of that work is designing student centric learning so focusing on meeting the needs of kids and what that would take so we spent quite a bit of time uh, researching and, and looking at literature and so on and so forth 
figuring out what, what the key elements of that were. And certainly it was like struck a chord when um, the first person who presented was talking about you know, confidence, which comes from confidence. And that certainly came up as uh, some of our uh, important uh, um, elements that were needed to be tackled. So our, our, the questions we really started to deal with um, are these, and you can see probably some similarities to, to what your jurisdictions or your uh, areas of, of, uh, of uh, responsibility, the things that you're likely tackling. So one of the first ones in, in some of our project work was how to better meet the needs of our students. How do teachers meet the, the needs of, of all their students? And uh, we, we certainly delved into things like uh, the learning as a foundation for the needs of students, understanding the, the whole class, the whole group of kids, and then in that, trying to uh, provide information to teachers uh, around that. So one element of this, what we probably all have um, what in Alberta is called CUNY files, or CUNY of record. Uh, and not a lot of teachers, I, I, I'm a teacher, and when I was in the classroom, I taught uh, uh, technologies to kids. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time down in the classroom track looking at uh, why some of my students had uh, different learning needs. Uh, it was time consuming, I had to tutor kids, and uh, it, was, you know, it was difficult. So how did I, how could I better meet the needs of my kids? Uh, I, you know, as an intuitive teacher and experience, uh, will try and meet their needs, but today, uh, we can digitize as much of that information. So we're working on a project right now that, that digitizes, digitizes student records, uh, digitizes the data behind it, because teachers are all producing information about their kids from uh, past assessment data, attendance, uh, reports about uh, if kids are outliers and they have uh, learning difficulties, those reports are available, uh, their provincial achievement results. All that data is out there, we have just tons of it, and we're trying to make it easier for, for teachers to have a quick snapshot of who all their kids uh, are, what's who some of those uh, special needs kids are, so that they can plan, uh, so that they can better meet the needs of kids. And I won't go into it, if you have questions, we can talk about that at some point. So the, the, the competencies certainly were, were critical and very aligned with the, I think it was OC, OC uh, competencies that we published for uh, around the world. Many of our problems are, are adopting similar competencies, uh, and I'll, I'll bring those up in a minute. Certainly engaging all of the stakeholders. How do we do that? What are, what are we doing to engage stakeholders, students, parents, uh, all of our educators, and, and working on uh, ways that, that build capacity and connections between them to help solve their issues? And then what are all the tools we need? So what are the, the tools that continue to evolve? So over now 10 years, all of those tools and technologies are continuing to grow and evolve. And then how do we empower our teachers and students to continue to uh, improve learning? So these are some of the big questions that we dealt with, and I quickly did a couple of them. Um, so we're, we focus on designing learning. So I mentioned understanding who your class, your class is, students, teachers, understanding who their students are, uh, and engage, engaging the, all of the kids in that, in that group. And you have that information to help customized learning so that more students can all stand in the group and, and, and process. And a lot of it, and it fun, foundationally, is ensuring that the, the class environment, some of the content is digital, uh, because we're more flexible and can use uh, text to speech and very different technologies to, to help uh, ensure that all kids can uh, engage, and as well as allowing kids to represent their understanding through multiple forms, creating digital content to share in groups that engaging for them. Uh, and then balance assessment. So, uh, assessment for our uh, as learning uh, is really critical so that our, our teachers are not just uh, providing text at the end, but it's uh, balanced throughout the whole program. And then the whole notion of ubiquitous, ac ubiquitous access to technology becomes critical. And uh, when I joined uh, school strictly, I uh, came as an educator and uh, it was really important for me to ensure that uh, all of the infrastructure worked 100%. Uh, I, in my past life, was working with a group of teachers and training them on this technology. We'll go back to it later. Uh, it's not working 100%. Uh, me as a teacher, I could, I could work through that. I have no problem there. Or any technology is glitching. But some of our educators just can't stand that. 
if they, they want it to work, they don't want to have to bug stuff all the time. So for me as a you know, an IT leader in that role, I really, really wanted to ensure that you know, Wi-Fi was, was strong, that, that uh, internet was always there, and uh, we could download and upload great uh, uh, content to our little bridges. And as they have technology, so we ensure also that our students uh, uh, have what they need in the classroom. Uh, we are a BYOD environment. All our kids, uh, and we have 23,000 students in, uh, in high schools. All those kids bring in in the high schools, bring in their own technology. If they can't afford it, we provide them. So we have like Chromebooks, we have some MacBooks, and, and, and there's nobody in the school that uh, goes without it. They need technology. In our middle school and elementary schools, we have lots of iPads, Chromebooks, uh, and, and again, there, we can bring it in for lots of home where we have uh, lots of equipment for them, and it, and it works. We have a complete IT team that it all functions well. So, the 21st century competencies we recognize these in a very aligned to what we heard this morning. So, being a critical thinker, a problem solver, an innovator, a communicator, a collaborator, will be there. Typically engaged, self critical learner, information media literate, financially and economic. Those are some of the competencies. Um, we have, in terms of assessments, we have uh, standardized or report card in the jurisdiction. So all of our schools have moved towards uh, assessing these competencies as part of the curriculum. That is doing a huge, huge job uh, in the jurisdiction because uh, we have some schools where they you know, assess kids on one report scale, and another one more than one scale, and another one percentages, and so on and so forth. So a huge team to work with, our, with all of our community. And parents and systems understand where they're coming from, and the teachers and community. Uh, and that, that has been a big focus of the data uh, in the group, and then we also do the scale for community intelligence. And that you know, it's been a big change, we've come a long way. But when we've done that, we have to, have to standardize, then from year to year, we can look at it. And again, um, one of the critical, longitudinal data in terms of, of the performance of the kids, so that Within a click, within the community's power tool, a teacher on their uh, teacher portal can click and see all that data for, for the kid, uh, staff data for kids, and other information to help them uh, understand what's going to be the process. So, we have seen over the last number of years, uh, you know, uh, certainly in our high performing jurisdiction, our, our, our assessments, uh, provincial assessments have not supported us in the all end all. Are very, uh, are very successful. Um, we provide laptops to all of our teachers. Uh, we ensure that they have the training and the equipment. So we want to walk the talk. We want them to teach with that equipment. We want to make sure that they all have access and it works in, in the field. Um, we want our, our practices and our, our uh, processes of the jurisdiction and policies aligned with, with uh, um, what, what uh, we want to be able to on. And uh, a few other pieces I won't I'll just jump through them here. Um, today, so that data, so the questions I talked about before were really from about five years ago. Today, we're, we're dealing with um, other questions. Um, we want to ensure that uh, um, there's reliability and safety. Uh, you know, in, back when I started, we, we barely had any, any internet. Online search wasn't an issue, but today there's just such a, a vast array of different tools and technologies. Uh, so the big question is how do we uh, keep people safe? Uh, how do we ensure that uh, uh, the tools and technologies that teachers are using in classrooms, um, you know, they're not sharing information they shouldn't share, uh, that, that they are uh, keeping kids safe and private, that kids themselves are working that that space, they're working ethically and uh, safely in those spaces. So those are, those are big challenges. How do we do that? I'm sure we'll get back in the same place soon. Uh, how do we um, continue to foster a, a, a culture of learning improvement? Uh, with, with our changes in budgets and so on from the state funding side, we don't have the funding we have to put professional learning and, and research uh, with there, but we want to continue supporting it and providing uh, opportunities to. to Low numbers, uh, foster engagement, support to teachers who don't see uh, different uh, opportunities for them. It's really critical for us. 
completely across the map. And then uh, to use big system data, all of us in all of our school divisions have lots of information about learning. We want to be able to use that information to have teachers use it to help support the kids. How do we tackle it? Any questions about the question? I think we have.